Hey, Experience Church, I want to welcome you, whether you're joining us in person or you're watching online. Also want to say a big hello to all the men and women joining us in our correctional ministry. We're honored to have you guys with us. And I'm excited as I get to introduce to you a good friend of mine who is back with us today. Pastor Doug Garasic from Rust City Church in Youngstown, Ohio is in the house. Now a fun fact about his church is that they're in a mall too. And so we're not the only ones, but I'm pretty sure they don't have a hot rice. And so they're not quite on our level. But actually, when God first opened the door to the possibility of us moving into Northtown Mall, one of the first people I called was Pastor Doug, who was a huge help in us taking advantage of the opportunity that God had put before us. And one of the many things that I love about Pastor Doug is how real and authentic he is. He loves God, he loves people, and what you see is what you get, which is why he fits in so well here at Experience Church. Now he's written a couple of books and I've asked him to speak today on probably my favorite book that he's written called Wayside, which is all about how God shows up in our lives in the last place we'd expect to find him. How in some of the most difficult, worst moments of our lives is when God does some of his best work. It's going to be a powerful day, and so would you do me a favor and stand to your feet and help me give an experienced church welcome to Pastor Doug Garasic. Hey, 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 experienced church, how you feeling today? Man, good to see you. Give your neighbor a high five and say, I'm so happy I'm sitting next to you today. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm, I'm, you're okay too. Sorry, I didn't pick you. Man, I love your pastors. They are some of the most incredible people on the planet. We actually just got to hang out a few months ago in Niagara Falls together, just hanging out with a couple other pastors, enjoying some rest and relaxation. And I, I know you know this, but I just wanna say it. Sometimes we fail to realize how good the water we're swimming is really is. And you guys are so blessed to have your pastors lead this incredible work of God that he is doing right here in Defiance. I was with y'all at the YMCA a long time ago. I walked through this building before any wall got put up and we prayed together for what God was going to do in this space. And it is amazing. You need to know this. People on the state level and people around the country are looking at Defiance Ohio and what experienced church is doing. You are leading Leading the way. So can you put your hands together and honor God for what he's doing in this place? We honor your pastors. Man, they send their love. Also, uh, my family sends their love. My wife, Stephanie, and I have three boys. And they're going to throw the picture up here in a moment. And you're going to realize what one member of our family fits and the others don't. So can you pick out how... <laughs> we know the seed is strong in my household, Okay. If you know any gingers, knowing one is more than enough. But if you've got to deal with one, two, three, four, pray for my wife, Stephanie, when you think about it. She's got to deal with that. My oldest son, Parker, is like roaring at the camera. My, uh, my next son, Ian, uh, is just smiling, but don't let that smile fool you. He could be running a third world country right now as a small dictator. And my youngest... COVID baby, Lincoln Fox, uh, was a surprise to us, but we love him. And I don't know how many of you have maybe three kids, but we've learned something about three kids. Uh, the oldest wants to follow the rules. The second child wants to challenge the rules. The third child says, what are the rules? They don't even know what they are. They're just surviving. So that's my family. They send their love and I love them and they're amazing. And there you go. They can take that picture off at any time because then I'm just gonna wanna go home. So I gotta stay with you guys here right now. But my family is a miracle. And, and here's why my family is a miracle. Uh, uh, my story is this, my mother had me, she found out she was pregnant at 16, 16 years of age. This is before MTV Teen Mom was cool. This is in the eighties. This is when it's shameful. And my grandfather was an elder of the local Assemblies of God Church. And this was not okay that his daughter was pregnant at 16. And there were some tough conversations happening in that house, including abortion, that word was put out there, and getting rid of this mistake that was made. And my mother was agonizing over what to do. She's 16, she didn't know what to do, she didn't know where to go, she didn't have the resources to take care of herself. And she said she went up to her bedroom and she cried out to a God that she encountered in Sunday school. And she asked this God what she should do with the mistake that was growing inside of her. 
And she said for the first time, she felt like God spoke to her in her entire life. And she said she heard this thought, Lisa, if you give me this mistake, I will turn it into a miracle. That you don't have to run from it, but you can give it to me. And she said at that moment, she decided I'm gonna raise this child even if I lose everything else and I'm gonna do everything I can to show him the ways of God. And let me encourage you, church family, that when I started doing some research on my biological father who I'd never met, I found out some interesting things in my genealogy. I found out that he, even though I did not know him, he did not know his father and his father didn't know his father. I came from three generations of fatherless men. And when I see my sons, it's a representation of my God's ability to take what the enemy thought he was gonna use. See, I need you to understand something, church family. The God that we serve changes generations when we follow him. And so by me having three sons, it's a representation of a God who's saying, I redeem all things the enemy tries to do. God will use for good what the enemy meant for evil. Amen? Amen. And so when I see him, it just reminds me of the faithfulness of God. Now, listen, I gotta tell you this right up front. I am a crowd participation preacher. That means I preach better the more you talk back to me. So I like amens. I like that's good, and I'll even take a preacher white boy every once in a while. <laughs> so on the count of three, shout out whatever's in your spirit. One, two, three. <laughs> One time I was preaching in Texas, and I love Texas people, but they're crazy, y'all. <laughs> and this guy forgot what I said to say. You know, at the end of a message, if you've ever been in church, the keyboard comes down, it's this beautiful music playing. I always say it's like landing the plane, right? And the guy forgot what I said to say, and he shouted from the third row as loud as he could, preach it, cracker! <laughs> the ushers removed him from the service. I just want you to know that. Don't test the volunteers here at Experience Church. They will remove you from this place. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Listen, pastor's gonna be back next week. He's gonna clean all this up, okay? But we're here for a few minutes together. And, and so speaking of my family and speaking of this journey, I want to talk about this idea of dealing with a mess. And husbands, for a moment, would you lean in with me? Because I want to teach you how to be the greatest husband on the planet. Wives, give me an amen. We want this. You have got to recognize, especially when you have little kids, when you have some in diapers or a little bit older, but when you've got littles in the house, there is a moment where your wife has had enough of those children for the day and one of three things are gonna happen. One, she might eat one of them. <laughs> there are some mammals that eat their youngs. Look it up, okay? Two, she might murder you and then you might end up on dateline if you're not careful. Or three, you need to engage and let her get a night away from them children, okay? And so I, I like to take option three out of the three of those, right? And so, and so one night I get home from work. I notice my wife is with the kids. They're in diapers. It's little. It's all the... And she is just stressed. It has been one of those days that you just don't want to deal with. And I recognize this. And I try to be husband of the year material. And I'm like, baby, you need a night where you can go out with your girlfriends, get out of here, go enjoy, go out to eat, go do something, whatever you all want to do, and enjoy a night out on the town. I'm going to take care of these kids. You need a break. Husbands, when you're, you, there's a certain tell that your wife, when she doesn't believe you, she's going to act a certain way around you because she doesn't trust you in this moment. For me, it's when my wife speaks to me like I'm one of the children about a situation we're in. She goes, now you know, Doug, this is a big responsibility <laughs> to watch these kids. And I'm like, I know that, Stephanie. It's going to be fine. They have to live through the night. They have to have their diapers changed. You all know how to do that? You're gonna YouTube how to do that, Doug? What are you gonna do here? They have to be fed. They have, I go, Stephanie, stop talking before you ruin this moment. Leave with your friends. We have got this. It's boys night in, girls night out. We are okay. She goes, okay, I'm trusting you. She leaves. The moment the door closes. Now, I don't know if you guys have Costco's or Sam's Club. They, the moment the door closes, I look at my boys and I go, are you boys ready to party? And they're like, yeah, 
how we crank up the sound system. I don't know, like at Costco, we have this Costco where you can buy a container of cheese puffs that children can fit inside of, okay? So I take this container full of cheese puffs, and I, we, I don't know if you've seen the game Hungry Hungry Hippos, but I start rolling them on the ground, and my kids are going, hum, 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 hum. And I'm like, get in the cheese puff container, roll them down the hallway. We're having a great night. And at one moment, my, at the time, my second child, who was my baby at the time, he's in a T-shirt, he's got a diaper on, he's been eating so many cheese puffs that his cheeks are just like, he's just powder coated in cheese puffs. You can't separate his hair from his face, it's so orange. <laughs> and he's all, blah, blah. and then he's like, Daddy, I think my belly's got boo-boos in it. And I go, see kids, that's the consequences of partying too hard, lesson learned. And he's like, Daddy, my tummy hurts. And I'm like, oh, you're okay, baby. And, and for all the parents in the room, I'm about to say something that's gonna grieve your spirit. It's gonna grab you, because you've lived this. And if you're not a parent yet, just prepare yourself for it. He's going, oh, oh. he's making these noises. Mm, mm, mm. And there's a term as a parent you learn called blowout diaper. <laughs> Do I have a witness in the house of God today? Mm, mm, mm. And normally they go up or down. His went to the side. He goes, I'm like, goo. Fires out the side. We have hardwood floors. He's in his bare feet. And he's so discombobulated from this moment. And he's like, oh, daddy. And he starts walking right into the mess that he made. Baby bare feet, hardwood floor, slippery surface. He lands on his back. Now he's upset even more and he's crying and screaming. And in his crying and screaming, he's flaring his arms. He's making like basically a snow angel. <laughs> and he goes, Dada, help! And as he says that, I look at him and I can't help myself, but then I look at the front door. And I think, she'll be home anytime now. If I just leave, she can take care of all of this. And I'm tempted, I go, no, no, husband, dad, no, get back in this. And so I decide, I straddle over top of this mess. And with, I don't know, it's like Herculean strength, you know, that's right. I grab him by his little shirt and I'm like the Terminator, I'm like Arnold. And without bending my elbow, I just lift him straight up in the air like this. I would take him to the shower and just hose him off. And I like pick him up and I'm holding him. He's like dripping with all the mess that he's made. And he's like, like this, he's hanging up and he goes, he says the most audacious thing anyone could say in this moment. He goes, Daddy, I need a hug. <laughs> no. <laughs> he says it again. I told him, no, no. Daddy, I need a hug, please. <laughs> no. And I don't know how God speaks to you, but sometimes it's like a lightning bolt hits me really fast and I'm still unpacking it years later. But God hit me in this moment and he spoke to my heart and he said, Doug, when you were laying in your mess and when you had nothing else to offer, you cried out for your dad being me to get you in your mess. And when I grabbed you and picked you up, I didn't hold you at an arm's length away, but I embraced you because you're my kid. And because you're my kid, I held on to you even though you had a mess. Don't cheer for this part. Because then I decided to hug that kid and we made a poop sandwich. And I embrace my kid, why? Because a father's mercy is greater than your mess. And at church, I'm here to encourage you today for the next few minutes that I don't know what mess you're living in right now. I don't know if you've got a financial mess, a relational mess, a physical mess. I don't know what mess you are walking in right now. And you might have bought the lie that God is absent or God isn't interested or you're not good enough for his love. But I'm here to remind you today that his mercy is greater than any mess. And he's not a God that will be distant from you, but he's a God who will embrace you and love you in spite of the mess that you are living in. And some of y'all might be over here like, you know, I don't know if I see that in the Bible. Well, I'm happy you said that. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at a moment in Scripture where there's a man named Bartimaeus. 
And we're going to learn his story about how God met him in his mess. And I bet you as we read this story, you'll see yourself in your own mess. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 says this. Then they reached Jericho. This is Jesus and his disciples. As they reached Jericho, they left the town and a great crowd followed him. And then here's what we learn. A blind beggar, say blind beggar. Blind beggar. Say blind beggar. blind beggar. Named Barnabas. Isn't this interesting? We learn his label before we see his name. We learn what other people say about him instead of what God gave him as his name. I wonder how many of us have been going through our lives, been believing the labels that other people have put on us. That you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not capable. You're not intelligent enough. I wonder how many of us had a teacher throw a label on us when we were in elementary ages that we're still believing today. I wonder how many of us had a, a coach who said we weren't gifted enough to be on that level on the team. I wonder how many of us had a boss that tells us that we're not a good worker or we're lazy or we're this or we're that. People want to project labels on others all the time. And the danger is, is when you start believing the labels that other people have put on your life. See, I had a high school English teacher who said, Doug, you are never going to amount to anything when it comes to the English language. And it's fun for me that I've not only published two books, one was a bestseller, I've got my third one coming out on my birthday, September 18th. And I wrote in my first book, in my opening line, hey, Mr. Kozar, how do you like me now? Come on, somebody. <laughs> hey. And my point is, and he actually got a kick out of it. And he said to us, he read it to every single class the day that it came out and he got a copy of it. He read it to every class he had in a public school, a book that I wrote about Jesus. He wrote the opening, he read the opening to every single class and he told his class, what I've been told, I wasn't there, that, hey, don't let anybody tell you what you can and cannot do. And so I'm here to encourage you. I don't know what labels have been put on your life. But I do know this, your Bible, if you'd read it, God has said some things about you as well. He says you're not meant to be the tail, you're meant to be the head. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. So here's what I wanna encourage you. We all will have labels put on us. Choose which ones you're gonna believe. I don't believe man's labels about me any longer. I believe God's labels about me. And so we meet this blind, disabled, and beggar in a position of life you would not want to be, man named Barnabas. And here's what the Bible says at the end of that verse, that he was sitting by the wayside. Say wayside. So this is an old English word, and I did some research for this, and the wayside was actually a thought from the Roman government. So back in the day, Rome, 2,000 plus years ago, they were the first government to institute indoor plumbing. Do I have anyone in the house of God grateful for indoor plumbing? If you're not, we will beat you up in the parking lot. No, I'm totally kidding. I love indoor plumbing. Sometimes when you have nothing else to be grateful for, be grateful that your indoor plumbing's working. Like when you think, God, what else is there? Now, thank God that I actually have a toilet that works. A sink that works. I've been on mission trips all over the country and there are people who would kill to have fresh water the way that we have fresh water right here. And, and, and so, so, so Rome created the first indoor plumbing. And, and so they had three roads that the Roman uh, world lived on. You had the Romans roads, which were all the marketplaces where all uh, people would buy their ingredients for food and their clothing and their different things. And so you had the marketplace road, but then you also had a fresh water road, that, a way that would bring in all the fresh water into the city. But knowing that you have to bring fresh water in, you have to bring gray water or wastewater out. So you have, you have the main roadway where all the life of the city and people were. Then you had the fresh water, which was going into the city, which wouldn't be a bad place to be. But then you also have this waste water or waste side, or another way to say it is the way side. And we find that Barnabas, this blind beggar, is not sitting where the market is, where people are. He's not even able to sit where the fresh water is. No, he's sitting at the wayside where the mess and the place where people's waste is leaving the city. I wonder how many of us have been put in a position where we're sitting somewhere we wish we were not sitting. I wonder how many of us are sitting somewhere in our life journey where we're going, I did not think my life was gonna end up sitting right here. Most of us are sitting at a wayside and we're internally saying to ourselves, 
To be honest with you, I don't think God can meet me where I am right now. We're sitting at our own waysides. And I wonder as we read in the story where God is about to meet Barnabas, I'm here to tell you that the last place you expect God to show up is usually where he shows up the biggest in your life. The last place you expect God to show up is usually the biggest place that God shows up in your life. Come on, hashtag preacher your way, boy. Give me something here. They told me 11 was gonna be the rowdy crowd. Are you the rowdy crowd or are we... Don't let nine o'clock beat y'all. Come on, somebody. Let's go. So he's sitting by the wayside. Let's keep reading. I want to go to verse number 47. Mark chapter 10, verse number 47 says this. When Barnabas heard that Jesus of Nazareth, say Nazareth, was nearby, he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David. Say David. Have mercy on me. Listen. We hear that he's Jesus of Nazareth, but the, and that's the place where he came from. He was known as Joseph's son, a carpenter. He was just a young rabbi to most people in Mark's gospel at this time. But then he shouted out, not Jesus of Nazareth, he shouted out Jesus, son of David. Now, for any Jewish person, they would know this. Son of David meant the promised one or the Messiah that was coming to set mankind free of their sins. Let me, for those of you who are not Bible historians, let me give you a little fact. The first time in Mark's gospel right here is the first time Jesus is mentioned as a son of David ever in Mark's recordings. We can conclude this thought. This blind man who could not see saw something more than everyone else around Jesus at that time. His own disciples weren't even calling him the Messiah yet. So you've got people following Jesus because he's doing miracles or trying to figure him out. And here's this blind man who's heard the stories of this miracle working man named Jesus. He's heard the power and he's been connecting the dots. This is not just some rabbi. This is not just some self-help guru. This is the Messiah coming before me right now. This is God and man coming before me right now. And if there's anybody who can do something for my situation, it's this guy walking by right now. So I'm gonna cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. See, I wonder how many of us have been missing Jesus by one word. We've been calling him Jesus of Nazareth too much in our actions in our life, and we need to start calling him Jesus, son of David in our life. Like, like some of us have got to get to the point where we quit making Jesus a option, and you need to start making Jesus the option of your life. You're like, well, yeah, I like what Jesus has to say, but what does Dr. Phil have to say at four o'clock today? I like what Jesus has to say, or maybe I don't like that, but my girlfriend, she's telling me something that I like more than what I hear Jesus saying right now. My mama's telling me something different than what the Bible says right now, so I'm gonna listen to her. And said, the problem is, is too often we wanna make him a option instead of making him the option of our life. <laughs> Barnabas is saying, you are the only option left in my life. Nothing can do what you can do right now. And I'm, I'm afraid for our American church that we've conditioned ourselves to make him a option more than making him the option. We got all these other things. I'm not saying, listen, I like Dr. Phil just like everyone else. How's that working out for you? I love that line, okay? He gave me that. It's great, but when you start listening to the voices of others more than the voices of God, you put yourself in a position where you do not see the supernatural happening in your life. Because God will only work with those that listen to him. And so you have Barnabas crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let's go to the next verse. Here's what it says in verse number 48. Be quiet. Many people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice the moment Barnabas wanted to follow God, haters manifested all around him. You ever notice when you're trying to do something for Jesus, the enemy seems to turn up the heat in your life? You're like, okay, God, I'm gonna trust you with the tithe. We're gonna start doing this as a household. And then all of a sudden, everything breaks in your household overnight. You're like, why is the sink leaking? The dog's crying and this is happening and my kids need new shoes. Man, God, this is over. 
How about you decide to start worshiping Jesus, but then you start thinking like a hypocrite because you're somehow some enemy starts reminding you of some things you've done in your past, and you think, I'm not worthy to worship Jesus. Like your worthiness is conditional to his love in your life. So often when we decide to pursue God, haters seem to manifest in our lives. Issues begin to happen in our lives. And don't be surprised when you follow Jesus that life gets harder because the enemy wants to keep you in a position of silence in your life. You can go to church, but sit down and be quiet and don't do nothing for Jesus. And the moment you start saying, no, God, I want to dare you to do some impossible things in my life. All of a sudden, all of a sudden enemies begin to manifest all around you. Haters start drinking haterade all around you. And just remember this. Haters often are elevators to the position God's taking you to. How you manage those is how God can take you places. And so he says, he only shouted louder. Say louder. louder. When the haters showed up and told him to be quiet, he only worshiped God more. I'm gonna hear and encourage you. When you feel like the enemy is just wreaking havoc in your life and your family around your circumstances, it is not okay for you to get quiet and go sit back down. It means your time to press into Jesus harder than you've ever pressed in in your life. It's time to worship greater than you've ever worshiped in your life. It's time to tell the enemy, ask for me in my house, no matter what hell you bring to me, we will serve the Lord. It's easy to serve God when things are going your way. It takes a person of character to serve God when they're not going your way. To say, God, I, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why I'm walking through this. I don't even need, I need to quit asking why. I'm in it, it is what it is. It's actually an indicator that you're trying to do something in my life because these haters are manifesting all around me. So I'm just gonna worship you as I walk through this moment because I will not let the enemy silence my praise. So he only shouted louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, let's keep going. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's about to get good. Verse number 49, I believe. When Jesus heard him, he stopped. So Jesus was on assignment somewhere. We're about to get to that. But Jesus was on assignment somewhere. And he hears this man out of the crowd, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says that he stopped. I don't know maybe why you love God or whatever you're trying to wrestle with who God is. Here's why I love Jesus so very much. That he can be going somewhere and he doesn't mind being interrupted when one of his kids cry out for his name. Like Jesus can be on assignment somewhere, but when one of his kids with earnest in his heart cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He will stop where he's going to let that kid get to him. He's not an absentee God who just is moving on and you gotta get on the train or get out the way. He will stop for his kids. It says that Jesus stopped. And then he said, tell him to come here. So they, these are the haters. So they called the blind man, cheer up, come on, he's calling you. Then the Bible says Barnabas jumped up, threw aside his beggar's coat and came to Jesus. Isn't it interesting the same people that were telling him to be quiet, telling him to simmer down, telling him that you don't need to talk to Jesus right now. When Jesus gave them some love and some attention, all of a sudden they wanna be his best friends in the moment. Uh, hey, listen, sometimes there's gonna be people that when you are working things out with God, they're gonna be saying all these nasty, critical things about you, but the moment God starts blessing you, they wanna get on that gravy train with you, somebody. I'm here to encourage you. Notice Barnabas didn't respond to them when they were hating, and he did not respond to them when they were celebrating him. He simply kept his attention on Jesus. See, if the devil can't stop God from moving in your life, he will give you this very dangerous trap. And the trap that he gives you is popularity. All of a sudden they're like, cheer up. Hey Barnabas, don't forget your homeboys when you're going to Jesus. And they want to be friends with him. And Barnabas, who's been probably an outcast his entire life, finally could feel like, oh, people love me. People accept me. People want me. And he could have found the temptation, the trap of popularity that wants to ensnare him from the purpose he was supposed to go on. But instead of stopping himself to talk to the crowds, he said, I'm not in this for you. When you are hating on me, that's your own problem. And when you're celebrating me, that's your own issue. I'm in this for God to do a miracle in my life. 
See, popularity is a trap that the enemy will use to stop you from your purpose. I'm gonna say that one more time. That's a great spot for an amen. So I'm just gonna set you up for that, okay? Popularity is a trap that the enemy will use to rob you of your purpose. Ooh, come on, talk to me, church. It is. Popularity is a trap. You start getting successful. You start getting, I've met more people. I have more people that I encounter that are wildly successful that will not give it up because they're so used to the entrapments of their success. They will miss the miracle that God wants to do in their life because they're too caught up with the blessings and the popularity of the world they're living in right now. It's a trap the enemy uses to rob you of your purpose. And so Bartimaeus ignored them when they're hating and he chose to ignore them when they were celebrating. And I'm gonna hear and encourage you today, do not let popularity or the lack thereof rob you from what God wants to do in your mission and purpose of your life. And so you find Barnabas, and here's what it says. It says that he jumped up and he threw aside his beggar's coat and he came to Jesus. Now this was like, for me, as you know, a guy who loves the Bible and I try to study it, the first time I read it, I thought, oh, okay, Barnabas, it might've been a hot day in Jericho. Maybe he's been doing a new bicep workout. He wanted sons out, guns out. I don't know. Maybe it smelled. He didn't want Jesus to encounter the smell. Right? I don't know. He threw aside some rag, some homeless person's rag. But then when I did some more research, I discovered something very significant. See, the Roman government, to bring them back around in this story, they were also the first government ever to institutionalize an ability for people to give benevolence or charity to those misfortunate. So what would happen is if you were like Barnabas and you're blind and it stopped you from being able to work, somebody would bring you to a Roman officer. They would evaluate your disability. They would deem it as acceptable or unacceptable. And if it was an acceptable disability, they would issue you a beggar's coat. This was a government-issued jacket that he was wearing. And when he wore this, this told the citizens of Rome, especially Jericho, which was a very affluent community, that person has gone through the right channels to receive benevolence. They're not scamming you. They're not working the system. If you want to give charitably, go ahead and give to that person who has that beggar's coat. Are you following me? Yeah. Now let's look at this one more time. It says when Jesus offers him this moment, he doesn't even know what he's gonna get yet. He says, tell him to come here. The Bible says that he jumped up and he threw aside his beggar's coat. He let go of his very means of surviving. The very way that he received any money to buy food, to possibly get shelter, to do anything. He let go of every bit of security he had in his life. He threw it aside. He said, I'm gonna let go of surviving so I can have a chance of thriving with this guy right here. I've gotta let go of the old. I've gotta let go of the things that I know that I've clung on to to get something I've never gotten before. Trusting that if Jesus gives it to me, it's better than what I've been holding on to in this life. There's too many of us who've been clenching our beggar's coats throughout our whole life. It's a relationship, it's a friendship, it's a job, it's a position and status in our life. We've been holding on to something so tightly that Jesus wants to give us something new, but we'll never get it because we won't let go of what's old in our lives yet. Notice he didn't have his miracle, but he's willing to let go of the old to take on the new. Notice he didn't have what he took to thrive yet, but he was letting go of what he was surviving with. And church, I'm here to encourage you. It is time to throw aside our beggar's coats and get before a God who can do something supernatural in our lives. Verse number 51, let's go to 51. It says this, Jesus, when he gets to him, he asks him a question. What do you want me to do for you? He says, my rabbi, the blind man says, I want to see. Now, can I be honest with you? When I read this verse the first time, I said to the Lord, I was, in, I was reading it and I said to the Lord, why did you waste a Bible verse on this rhetoric that I just read right here? Obviously, the dude wants to see, why did Jesus waste our times with him asking this question and why did you have to write it here? In my life where I need your help in a lot of other areas, this is a waste of a Bible verse, Jesus. 
Because let's get into the story. Okay, let's pretend we're all in Jericho, right? We're the crowd, we're the disciples, we're moving through with Jesus, right? We're all, there's all these people pressing in on us, and here's Jesus, and we hear out of this far area, this wayside, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people are like, be quiet, dude, I'll punch you in the face. I don't know if they say that, but and then you hear it even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And we're following Jesus, and all of a sudden, he's like, he stops, and we're like, everybody stops. We're like, what's about to happen? He's like, Bring him to me. And I can imagine, like, maybe he had, like, something over his eyes or whatever. And so people are guiding him to Jesus, right? And, like, we're all disciples. And if I'm there, let's say, like, I'm over Jesus' shoulder, like, kind of hanging out, like, you know, chomping the popcorn. And I'm, like, I'm pulling out my phone. I'm, like, this is about to go viral. Because he's, because this dude is coming up to him that cannot see. We know this guy wants to what? I mean, like, Jesus, we all know this. And Jesus, when he gets to him, we're all waiting. And Jesus goes, what do you want from me? I'm like, Jesus, we know what this dude wants. But, you know, when I read scripture, I don't know what you do, but when I read scripture and I don't understand something, I ask God to reveal it to me. I say, God, let me get into some other people's revelation that might already be on this earth or give me fresh revelation. I want to know what your word is saying here. So I asked, what does verse 51 mean to me and what does this mean to us? And I felt like Jesus said to me, Doug, don't you realize he could have asked for anything that this planet could provide him and we would have gave it to him. He could have said, Jesus, I'm hungry. I haven't had a meal in a long time. Could you feed me? And he said, absolutely, we have some people who take care of that. Go ahead, guys, feed him. Jesus, I've been living out by the wayside and I'm sick of it. I, 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 I need some new clothes and somewhere else to live. Yes, we have a program of some people that would love to take care of that. Guys, can you help take care of that? Let's get him uh, taken care of. He, he needs shelter. He needs new clothing. Jesus, I've been neglected my whole life and I'm in these smelly, poop-filled clothes and, and I just want to hug. I just want somebody to know that I want to feel loved. He goes, cool, yeah. Doug loves hugging people like that. Doug, go ahead and give him a hug. See? That's good comedy, folks, when it comes back around like that. Doug would love to hug you. And you, I think you'd smile and wink at me. Maybe your Jesus is more serious. Mine is like a friend, so I don't know. Um... My point is this, he would have gave him whatever he asked for. And I think Jesus is here today saying to you, you can ask me for natural things and I will provide them. You can also dare me to do some supernatural things in your life and watch what I can do as I do supernatural things in your life. I think so many of us, we are so content with just asking God for the natural that we don't dare God to do the supernatural any longer. Like, like some of us, our marriages are on the rocks and you barely got here and you haven't talked in a long time and you're thinking to yourself, dude, we're going through the motions for the kids. I'm here to tell you to dare God to bring that thing back to life. Some of us, our health is so broken, so jacked up and you think, well, it's just what I deserve. No, God can do a miracle where there is not, he is able. It's great to ask God for your daily bread, but he's also a God who can do more than just your daily bread. Who's willing to dare God to do the impossible? Barnabas says, God, I know in the natural this is impossible for me to see, but I'm gonna say it to you, Jesus. I want to see. If he would have said that to me, I would have no answers for him. But he said it to the right person. Verse 52, my favorite verse, and we're gonna be done with this. It says, Jesus said to him, go for your faith, say faith, faith. has healed you. Notice he didn't say my strength has healed you. My abilities have healed you. He says, no, your faith. Some of us have downplayed the power of our faith. The Bible says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can look at a mountain in front of you and say, be thou removed and cast into the sea. God has an ability to move mountains when your faith is activated and you say, God, I'm not trusting in my abilities. I'm trust my faith is put in yours and I will stand on you, God. He says, because of your faith, you have been healed. And it says, instantly the man could see, and here's my favorite part of the whole story, and he followed Jesus down the road. Now, for some of you Bible historians out there, if you would read in Mark's gospel, Mark is the shortest of all four gospels. In Mark's gospel, it shows that the next place Jesus landed was the walk to his death to the cross of Calvary. Jesus was literally on his way to his death. And if he is God, the way the Bible declares he is God, he knew that on his way. 
So Jesus is walking to his death and Barnabas is following him down the road. We don't hear about Barnabas again, but here's what we can assume. Barnabas followed Jesus to his own death. See, some of us, we don't realize this. We think that when we say yes to God, it's, yeah, it's gonna be the end of all my fun. It's gonna be the death of me. And you couldn't be any more true when it comes to it being the death of you. When you follow Jesus, he often takes you somewhere that you would never go on your own. And it causes you to have to lay down every bit of your life that you have to lay down and say, God, I don't know why this is so much harder than I thought, but I'm willing to let go of my old, cast aside my beggar's coat, cast aside all the labels that people put on me. I'm willing to follow you even when haters are shouting and the enemy is being so loud in my ears. I'm gonna praise you and I'm gonna follow you and I'm gonna dare you to do impossible things. Here's what you've gotta realize. The appropriate response to a miracle of God in your life is to follow him to the end of your days. The appropriate response to God showing up is to say, God, I will follow you the rest of my days. And can I tell you, there's no greater miracle that God could ever do than saving a sinner's heart. Someone who is far from God, who has no way to get back to God on their own. But Jesus has this incredible way to make a way where there was no way. And the appropriate response is not to get the miracle. See, what Barnabas could have done and what so happens often in the American church today is God shows up and gives us a miracle, and then we go looking for our beggar's coat again. Where did that go? I gotta find, now I can see, where is, where is it? And we pick it back up, we put it back on, we go back to the wayside, and we say, yeah, God did something one time for me, but you know what, this is my place in life. That is no longer your place in life. You weren't meant for the wayside, but you were there. God was sovereign, he met you there where you didn't think he would. You got a chance to encounter him and he's doing a miracle and unfolding it in your life. And the worst thing that you can ever do is go pick up the old again when God is giving you something new to walk on. The worst thing you can ever do is go back to the old. Instead of saying, Jesus, I'm gonna follow you down the road, even to my death. Because even though Jesus died, here's the powerful thing. Even though Jesus died, he was rose again on the third day. The God that we serve isn't a God of death. He's a God of resurrections. So you might be following him to your death of who you've been, but guess what? He's gonna resurrect something greater in you than you could ever done on your own. When 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 I look at my life today and I remember that 18 year old who could not even get through high school, it is not the same human being because I have gone with death with him and I've been raised to life with him. I am not the same that I once was and it's not because of me, but the power of God through me. And let me tell you, if he can do it for this ginger, he can do it for you. (laughs) Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for this incredible church family. God, as maybe some of us have been identifying some labels that we put on ourselves or others have put on us. Maybe some of us have identified some beggar's coats that we've been clinging to because that's the only way we know how to survive. Maybe some of us are afraid to ask you to do a supernatural thing in our lives. God, I pray for faith to be released in the house of God today. A faith to dare you to do impossible things. And when you start unfolding those, let us follow you all the days of our lives, even to our deaths. And then we can partner with you in your resurrection. New life can be born out of the death of ourselves. So God, I pray for that courage to be in the house and for anyone watching online. With your head bowed and eye closed, stay here in a moment with me. I'm gonna ask you if you know the Jesus that I've been talking about. Maybe you followed him when you were younger. Maybe you never have really followed him in your whole life. Today is a day of salvation for you and your house. What I wanna do, and I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna call you out front, but I do wanna pray with you. I'm gonna count to three, and when I get to three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and say, that's me. I wanna say yes to making Jesus the Lord of my life today. The reason that I ask you to raise your hand is because it's the international sign of surrender. When you don't speak the same language as your enemy, you lift your hand in surrender. Now you might be saying, well, what are you talking about surrender and enemies? I thought God loved me. I thought he was like a friend. Well, he is, but here's the truth. Our sin separated us from God's love. And Jesus made a way where there was no way. He became the bridge to get us back to God's love. And so we all start this journey with surrender. 
And so when I count to three, I'm gonna ask you to not let your faith, not let your fear paralyze you, but let your faith have movement. When I get to three, if that's you, lift up your hands, say, that's me, I wanna say yes to Jesus today. One, two, three, put up your hands. God bless you, God bless you. Their hands up all over the room. God bless you, God bless you. Man, God bless you. Do me a favor, take those hands that are lifted and put them right on your heart. You feel your heart beating? God's not done with you yet. He's got a plan that will blow your mind. You give yourself to that plan and you get discipled, watch what God will do with you. So would everyone in the room repeat after me with these people that raise their hands? The reason why I want everyone to repeat it is because here at this church, you don't go it alone. We do it with you. This is family and community here at Experience. So everyone in the room, repeat after me with these people who raise their hands, would you say this? Dear Jesus, I ask you to be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin and give me a fresh start. I confess that I need you and I make you Lord. Teach me how to live for you all the days of my life. In your name I pray, amen, amen. Amen. Can we welcome home these people who said yes to Jesus today?